Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. Today, we are beginning a series with candidates for office, all the offices, the different offices across the state. And from the Big Island to Kauai to, and today to the jungles of Manoa. <laughs> <laughs> And we are going to talk to Dylan Armstrong, who is a candidate for the House of Representatives from Manoa. Aloha, Dylan. Thank Aloha. you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And for being our guinea pig, our number one candidate. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. That's all right. So tell us about Dylan. Who is Dylan? Well. I'm an urban planner by day. I worked in conservation for a decade. I've worked with our most endangered uh, Hawaiian wildlife species and plants. I have been a community member for, uh, you know, my duration of uh, time as a UH Manoa student, where I was receiving a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources Management. And I have continued to remain involved three years as a Manoa Neighborhood Board member, a member of different community groups such as Be Ready Manoa, and uh, you know, I, the community chose me. People continued to open doors for me. I thought, like so many of my, you know, young colleagues and friends, that I was going to have to move away. I was not expecting to stay here, but uh, because people continued to give me opportunities that I never imagined, um, I pursued them, and as such, built a career here. Now it's my turn to give back because my state representative is retiring. Oh. So I'm, I'm moving from that position of community advocacy to hopefully leadership. Well, now, Manoa Ready? Is that what you said? Oh, Be Ready Manoa. Be Ready Manoa. What is Be Ready Manoa? Be Ready Manoa is a disaster preparedness group, and I'm just a volunteer, one of many. But, but, but seriously, what, what, what does it do? So Be Ready Manoa is in charge of natural uh, disaster preparedness for, oh, okay. for our valley. And so we had a catastrophic flood back in 2004, October 30th, that caused millions of dollars in property damage, uh, including to UH Manoa's Hamilton Library, where mm. oh, I remember that, irreplaceable yeah. documents were lost. But human life and property was at stake, too, and, and a lot of people did suffer property damage. So flooding and hurricanes are the most common natural disasters for a community like Manoa. But we have so many other issues statewide. We have tsunami, we have wildfire, we have you know, environmental releases, let's say that a, a fuel truck, you know, spills over on H1. There are many different ways that we need to be prepared for what will happen in the event of an emergency, because we can't always expect the government to be there for us, especially not the federal government. Think of um, what happened after Iniki on Kauai. The entire south and east sides of the island were just devastated because all the utility poles went down. People were literally cut off, and we have stretches of road network on this island that are analogous. Think of Kalani Ole Highway. Um, if anything were to happen to that road, those people in those valleys would be isolated. But Manoa has two main entry points, so we also have to make sure that we're prepared to deal with natural disaster in our homes, to be safe as families, and then to help each other as a community. Now, we assume, of course, that everybody knows where Manoa is. Oh, right. But just in case there's somebody watching that doesn't know <laughs> where Manoa is, tell us, where is Manoa? Manoa is a celebrated place, a wahipana, that is situated in a valley at the back of the Kona district of Oahu. So it's right between Makiki and Tantalus and Palolo on either side. It is just Malka of Waikiki and Mo'ili'ili. So this is the location of the flagship university, um, UH Manoa campus, and it is where Barack Obama was born and where he spent a good part of his childhood. Um, it is an important place in Hawaii history, uh, including going back to the Wilcox Rebellion when um, you know revolutionaries were actually fighting in Manoa all the way over to New Uanu. So, uh, Manoa has been a, a big part of the state's history, going back to before the state when it was the kingdom. Wow, what a valley. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's whenever we see pictures, there's always the rainbows over the valley, right. which is why the students, the teams are all the bows. Oh, bows. <laughs> yes, That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So now, tell us, tell us the issues in Manoa. The issues that you see as a candidate mm -hmm. are most important in Manoa. Or, well, you'll be one of many, yeah. one of 50, 51, one. as right. a matter of fact. So what are the most, most important issues you see, A, that affect, affects Manoa, and B, everybody? Yeah. So what do you see? Well, mainly economy, uh, education and environment are at the top of people's minds. Manoa is largely a older community now in terms of senior citizens, people who are retired, and also people with disabilities. So there's an element of living on fixed incomes that is really prevalent, especially in the back part of Manoa. Uh, additionally, with um, property taxes rising due to um, speculative endeavors, uh, we think of Airbnb, monster houses, things that are the more negative side of development, um, creeping into even more settled communities like Manoa, those things uh, actually have a pocketbook effect on people on fixed incomes. We also have students, right? We have 43% of our people are renters, so you know, whether it's student housing, whether it's um, private you know, uh, rentals, we have an issue with a housing crisis. It's not as severe as some of the other communities, but it manifests itself just like it does across the state. We also have environmental you know, questions. Long term, there are species on the brink of extinction in Manoa. I've worked with them. There is you know, the question of what's going to happen with rapid ohia death. Could that devastate our watershed? Uh, we have invasive species, feral pigs, feral cats, et cetera. What is the right way to manage that? And there are many different answers. So, um, But most people think of the environment in terms of development. We want to maintain Manoa as a you know, unique, connected, special, safe place to raise a family, to know your neighbors. And that's an extension of the changes uh, that we see happening across Hawaii. People see how much other communities have, have uh, fallen in terms of uh, that social cohesiveness. And in Manoa, we're very protective of that. We want to make sure that um, you know, this is a place that feels a home. Additionally, uh, education, right? So UH Manoa is located in Manoa Valley. Uh, the daytime weekday population is over 20,000. It's bigger than yes. cities on the neighbor islands. So um, it's, it's a huge amount of money that passes through in terms of research, development, you know, the staffing for lecturers and professors and graduate assistants and um, you know, the people who take care of the facilities. It's a lot of activity. And to think of UH Manoa as a community within a wider community, um, UH Manoa has to be a good partner for the Manoa neighborhood. It has to be an economic driver for um, you know, the state. We have a declining middle class. We have rising cost of living. If we diversify our economy with UH Manoa as a third leg um, powered by research and development, we can continue to provide good living wages for families. Now, my memories of UH, uh, because I live on one side of the traffic. So at the end of the day, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Really big. <laughs> so, and you know, you plan your, your life around getting over there. Right. However, all of the parking in people's lawns and they, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. every day when yeah. students are there, yeah. is there something that, is there a plan for that? Is there a plan? somehow deal with all of the cars and and yeah. I mean there's no other way to get there yeah that's a good point so 40% so, uh, of the UH Manoa population lives within two and a half miles of the campus so they walk and that is from a 2012 transportation demand um, mm -hmm. study so was there a plan conducted yes do we have a plan to manage no <laughs> and okay. we need one. We yes. need one. Um, the state should be thinking about parking at that broad statewide level because Honolulu and specifically Manoa are not the only communities dealing with this. Now, the state has primary jurisdiction over the freeways and the highways, but uh, the state also has important planning 
and a say over pedestrian and biking and the local streets. Um, it can provide guidance. It can provide a standard. It can provide um, you know leadership for the counties to work with, and and it has done so. Uh, I experienced that as a transportation planner. I want to. You worked for the state. I worked for Oahu Metropolitan Planning Organization, oh. which is a independent and regulatory agency which is attached to HDOT, but it is independent oh, of it. Okay. Yeah, and um, that's typical of MPOs across the country. They're either attached to uh, municipal governments or state. It's very confusing um, for people not used to, you know, how that process works. It was confusing for me, but it's, it's an important process, and that's how we get federal money for our roads and buses. So, but again, back to this planning mm -hmm. of parking. Yeah. At, and I'm talking about UH, and I know it happens in other places, yeah. downtown, Chinatown, it's impossible. Yeah. Waikiki, forget it. But planning parking mm -hmm. at UH, that facility, parking facility, fills up in two, three seconds. Yeah. And then there's cars all over people's lawns. Do they pay to park on those lawns? Some do. Do the owners of the land say, well, you can park yeah. here, but this is what it costs. Yeah, it's not, un it's not unusual for private, uh, you know, owners to allow for rental, um, you know, for parking spaces. But um, going back to more of the nuisance aspect, which you're talking about, we get people parking all the way up past yes, the marketplace they do. in the residential neighborhoods. Yeah. So we want to manage that. And, and when I brought up the 40% um, of the UH Manoa population living within two and a half miles, what we want to do is we want to get as many of those people walking, biking, sharing rides, taking the UH Manoa shuttle, riding the bus, so that they are not parking in our communities. Make it easier to do the right thing than it is to do the bad thing that affects everyone else's quality of life. So the yeah. shuttle, mm -hmm. where does it go? Can, it, can, yeah. they, can you get it on King Street or University Avenue? There is some access for the uh, UH Manoa shuttle uh, through those areas. It actually goes to Moi, uh, sorry, to Makiki, and then there is a line to Moiliili. Um, so it's expanded since when I, you know, was mm -hmm. a student. I would, you know, support making it, you know, more accessible as long as there's a demand to get to campus within the certain hours of the day. Then the shuttle should, you know, continue should be to haul. Con con constantly, yeah. yes. Well, right. As long as there's class, as long as there's activity that drives, you know, population to campus. Well, given the digital age, mm -hmm. surely you could make reservations online. Uh, so that is for the shuttle. Right. Say I will be at such and such a corner at such and such a time. Yeah. And the shuttle will say, well, we've got enough people there at that time. You know, they publish what time they'll be at this corner and mm -hmm. that corner. And everybody at the university is online. At the very least, there could be an app in the future. Um, the city, right. you know, the bus has the bus. an app. Mm -hmm. And when it works, it works really well. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't always work great, but when it does work, it provides location you know, for uh, arriving and departing buses. And, um, you know, you can look up where your bus stop is if you're in an unfamiliar area. Mm -hmm. So when that works, that's really handy. And the UH shuttle could Could do the go same up. thing, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking that uh, how to move all of these people without all the cars. Part of it is just making sure that people are um, living relatively close to campus. What about that new building at the corner of University and Kings? Yeah, that's. Um, is that a is that a regular condominium, or will students be able to live there? Are the prices such that students can live there? Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see because it's certainly being marketed as student housing. Um, many people are skeptical, but the important thing is that. You know, that's one building out of several, and Pox Alley is going to be redeveloped um, according to, you know, everything that um, myself and other people in the community have heard. So what kind of housing is that going to be? Because KS is, is that going to be housing also? Well, it is currently housing. KS um, provides behind the, um, you know, all of the businesses, the, the first and second floor commercial. So can we redevelop that into a community where people are safe, where people can have a neighborly feel, even if it is more of an urban environment, and where they can walk to campus? Yeah, we don't want we don't want the excesses of Kaka'ako repeated in Mo'ili'ili. Right. 
Ah, so we have to take a break. Okay. And when we come back, let's talk about the excesses of Kaka'ako. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll be right back. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. And we are doing a series, this is series number one, with candidates that are running for office, local offices all across the state. And today we are visiting with number one um, candidate, uh, Dylan Armstrong, who is running for the House of Representatives from Manoa. And we were just beginning to talk about the excesses of Kaka'ako, <laughs> unquote. Yeah. Well, but you're an urban planner, so yeah. what do you see as the excesses of Kaka'ako and how you don't want that transferred to Manoa? So the original intention, as I understand it with HCDA, was to make sure that there was urban infill so that local families could access all the basic goods and services they need living in an urban environment where they aren't car reliant. And it's not the same as not having a car, but just not being car reliant. So being able to potentially walk to school, being able to potentially walk to the grocery store, have that urban living experience. Um, but we see increasingly that it's gone the way of luxury housing. And luxury housing is not gonna fill the needs that we as a state have. We, including people in Manoa, are pressed by the cost of living. So when we do development, it needs to be done right. It needs to be done the way it's intended and agreed upon, and it needs to be done for the benefit of our people. So if it's not being done for the benefit of our people, why do it? Um, you know, it's easy to be critical or argue for, uh, you know, any sort of development, whether it's housing, transportation. The important thing is that there's a context and a need. And the need with housing in the next decade has to be putting our people back to work and making housing that local families can access. So currently, um, you know, even existing housing supply is becoming inaccessible because of Airbnb. Um, I don't doubt that that's an issue in Kaka'ako as well. The incentive is stacked against uh, local renters. You can make three and a half times the rental income on an Airbnb that you can on, a, on an average apartment. So, and that's based on research done by the Hawaii Center, uh, Appleseed Center for, mm. uh, uh, pardon me. Yes. Center for Law and Economic Progress. <laughs> I always stumble over the name. But the point being that you know we have a system that's not quite working as well as it used to for local people. How can we change that? And when I say local people, I should just say all of our residents, right? So yes. we have 43% of our households, I mentioned previously, 43% of our households are renters. Um, in Manoa, it's kind of invisible because you might be renting a house and you're right next to a homeowner. So single family home, single family home, you go off of what you're immediate um, impression but, is. But we also have lots of generations in a single family. Yes. So those don't get counted in yes. the homeless yeah. issue. Well. Where you have three and four generations right. in a house. And so, no, we, we tend not to see them. Yeah. 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 That's and if right. you're making $10 an hour, you can't pay $1,800 a month for rent. It's just. Yeah. You can't add up that many dollars, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah. we we are we want to pay more to our employees, but small businesses don't have that much to pay. That's true. And we have this thing that we love is medical care that the employer has mm -hmm. to pay into. Yeah. And then when he pays that plus all the state taxes. There's not much to give yeah. 
the employee. That's a good point. That's, I, yeah. that's not much left. Yeah, that's a good point. And so if the employer raises the cost, then you have to pay the raise. And then everybody says, oh, the prices are going up. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we face a similar issue of passing uh, the burden of taxation onto uh, working people when we talk about investment properties, right. right? So taxing investment properties has to be done very carefully because most of our affordable housing is actually um, mom and pop owners. Let's say that they have two properties. Maybe they uh, moved out of their old property because their family's aged and you know mm. some have moved out. So maybe they rent their old home or vice versa, or maybe they bought an apartment building, not a big one, but maybe it was built 40 years ago, so um, you know the costs of the construction have been depreciated already. If we raise the taxes on those properties, then that will be passed off largely in the form of rent. So we want to make sure that we're going after investment properties that are you know, the empty condos, the timeshares that don't benefit anyone here, the stuff that's held by non-residents. Um, real estate investment trust is one you know idea that's talked about a lot, but um, you know basically when we raise taxes or when we go after any sort of new revenue, we have to make sure that the source is the truly intended source because typically, as you're suggesting, there are ways that that will be passed off to consumers or renters. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now let's go back to Manoa, and you're an environmentalist. Yeah. Manoa Stream. Yeah. It's so beautiful, the waterfalls that come down and into the stream. Yeah. How's the health of the stream? It's not great. Uh, I, when I was an undergraduate, I did monitor the stream quality uh, near faculty housing, about 50 feet downstream of it, and also over at Dole Street, which was far yeah. worse. So. The water quality is affected by all of the runoff. We have increasing paving of the valley. I want to work on, you know, incentives for new development, you know, homes that are being rebuilt, homes that are being renovated, homes that are having ADUs added onto them to keep the paving as minimal as possible so that we don't have more stormwater flowing into the Manoa stream. There's um, all of the stuff that that picks up, you know, everything from cigarette butts to, you know, plastic to Know, hydrocarbons from vehicles or mm -hmm. other other sources of petroleum but um, you know the Manoa stream itself is half uh, channel or canal and half uh, semi-natural and you know flowing into the um, surrounding substrate the soil uh, when you're in Manoa Valley um, by the time it reaches the Alawai Canal the water quality is terrible the temperature is high there's a lot of sedimentation the flow mm -hmm. um, is sluggish, it lacks turbidity. Part of that is natural, but it's a breeding ground for bacteria and the kinds of things we associate with uh, the Alawai, you know, water quality. But this is also important in terms of flooding. When those waters flood, we don't want that to be more of a health risk yes. for people. So what can can the community, you, let's assume you're gonna get, ele get elected. Mm -hmm. So how can you, with the aid of the community and everyone, work on that natural resource because the stream is so precious. It is. Our water quality yeah. is so precious. How can you, or what can you do? Let me put it that way, yeah. not how, but what. Yeah. What, what can you do to save that stream? I know we don't think of it as endangered. We don't think of water as endangered, but it is. Yeah. What can you do? How can you do that? Right. So we want to capture more of the rain and stormwater. We want to make sure that what is flowing into the stream is, you know, being filtered by as much as possible some sort of vegetative, you know. Uh, is there a dam surface. up there someplace? There's a, so there's a variety of flood mitigation um, infrastructure, and that's a, a bigger U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project, right? But I mean, does it exist? Is there a dam? A dam somewhere? Per se? Up a dam, up real high up the stream where uh, there are there are things that you know um, impound the stream and, and gather water. Um, there's also it currently being developed some sort of uh, you know flood water uh, spillway and retention ponds 
So that's all designed to keep people safe. That's the primary purpose of the current work going on in Manoa Stream, whether it's the city and county side or DLNR. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. And no, I'm just saying, when you split it up, well, that's not mine. That was his. Uh, you know, jurisdiction can be uh, Can be tricky. a bear. It yeah. Can be a, but we see that with roads. Everything. We see that with utility. You know, that's not unusual. But, but they're, they are doing something. Oh, yeah. So the current controversy over Manoa Stream at Woodlawn uh, Bridge is right. uh, all about, you know, protecting people from flood risks. Now, I understand that Hawaii is last of all the 50 states in infrastructure. Yeah. What about the bridge? About Woodlawn? Woodlawn? Yes. Oh, well, I think the bridge is okay for the time being, but it's the rest of the infrastructure in Manoa. The infrastructure in general needs in, in general, because we are work. at the bottom. Yeah. And that's according that to national Manoa statistics. People. Yeah. Hawaii is the very bottom. Yeah. And, so and what the, about Manoa? Yeah, the, the infrastructure. The worst is Nepo Street, and that is a small dead end road off of Manoa Road in the very back of the valley. And for three years, 2015, 2015 this began with a private development at the back of the road. Um, building over currently vacant, um, or I should say vegetated, um, property. Um, in three years, not a single home has been built. I haven't seen a foundation laid. Um, I've seen sidewalks at the end of the, of the road, but Nepo Street has been torn up the entire time, and the residents and all of the properties before that development have been dealing with flying gravel and potholes and um, road that is torn up that looks like gecko skin, so it's loose patches of asphalt on top of a, a much uh, sandier uh, or dustier substrate. Um, it is unfair that people are dealing with that, all because of you know, how a private developer has chosen to make use of public resources. And that's the kind of thing that separates me from you know, some of the other candidates. I don't just go after whatever the big issue is. I go after the right issues. Well, tell us now. We we have a minute left. Yeah. Look right into the camera. Oh. And tell us exactly that why you should be elected and why you are different from your other candidates. Oh. Go. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, again, my name is Dylan Armstrong, and I'm running to be the state representative for Manoa Mo'ili Ili and part of Kaimuki out to Third Avenue. So the reason why you should vote for me is that I have the scientific and technical expertise necessary to take care of the issues that matter to you and your family. So whether it's you know economic issues, I am prepared to work on the state budget. I know how to monitor government spending. I did that as a transportation planner. I know how to work on infrastructure because I've worked on roads and you know currently as an urban planner I work on buildings. So those are those are areas where we can invest in the right things and do so carefully with your money. We want to make sure that housing and homelessness gets better, not worse. I'm the only one of the five candidates who's done anything on homelessness. There was a really bad encampment at uh, YLI Road at the H1 on-ramp, and people were dealing with crime. People were fearful. Um, people were waking up in the middle of the night to you know, hear or find that people were rooting through their rubbish. So we want to make sure that people who are needy are getting into shelters, and we want to make sure that people who have been longtime residents are safe, that Kapuna aging in place are not going to be victimized by burglars and other forms of property crime. I'm the person to do that. I'm supportive of the Neighborhood Security Watch. I have been involved in a lot of our community issues over the last, you know, decade. And, you know, I, I think I've also been the hardest working candidate. I've knocked on thousands of doors, thousands more than my closest competitor. So um, if, you, if you're looking for evidence, the proof is in the pudding. Well, let me add one thing that you didn't say. Oh. But you're not married and you don't have any children, therefore you can give full time to the job. <laughs> I'm looking to settle down, but I No, you know, I, I meant but today point. you can give full time. To, I mean, that's yeah. important that you can give full time to the job. Now that I am a candidate, one thing that stands out to me is um, the toll that being a it candidate takes, takes it for takes, everyone. It makes it me takes, respect everyone who's a candidate It more. takes a big toll. That's why I'm saying, yeah. adding that you don't have to worry about what are the children on, on you know, getting home on time and all that. But I'll so, have children. Later, but right now. And, um, okay. <laughs> right now. But yeah, my focus is taking care of there the needs of everyone in Manoa Valley, Mo'ili'ili, and you know, 
out to Third Avenue. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming, and congratulations, good luck, thank you. and keep in touch, and we'll talk to you after the primary. Appreciate it. All right. Aloha. Aloha.